I would yeah. like to say something about fear. Why do you think people are scared in general, you or anyone else? Why do you think they are scared of snakes? Uh, I mean, what's the first thing that comes to a person's mind if somebody's scared of snakes? What is the first thing that comes to mind? I think the, the bite, yeah. you know. Uh, see, for example, even though a dog can bite us, you know, uh, you, you still feel there's a, a, a rabies a injection and things like that. But I think with the snake, like I, I would think is that first I try, I, from what I know is that you have to identify whether it's a venomous snake or not. Then you need to have the anti-venom. Uh, so, you know, these things are a little bit ambiguous, yeah. you know. Yeah, so I, I think that would add to your fear of yes. snakes. But I would generally think that, you know, we're introduced to this fear when we are young. Like uh, if somebody takes us to a park or a garden, for example, our parents, when we were young, for example, they would say like, you know, don't play in the grass, there might be a snake that will bite you. Or don't True. play out in the night, come home early before it gets dark because a snake would bite you. Yeah. The first thing that we are learning about snakes when we are young, uh, or rather subconsciously put into our mind, is that snakes bite. Hmm. But if I ask you, have you seen a snake bite? No. I don't think you would have seen a no. snake bite. Yeah. But what would you tell somebody who has these fears? It's something that it's part of living in society. So yeah. how how do you, as a young adult, how do you overcome this fear? Yeah. Especially, Benhil, for somebody like me who enjoys the outdoors. You know, we mm. want to be outdoors and respectful at the same time. So yeah. how would I address this? So that's, that's beautiful because if you want to be outdoors, outdoors could be outside your doorstep or it could be in a while you're trekking True. somewhere, right? Uh, the thing here is that if you have knowledge about the behavior of a snake mm. or of anything else you're scared about. If you have knowledge mm. on that subject, mm. your fear automatically comes away. I've had people like really scared of snakes, you know, have their heart pulping and their eyes popping out when they should just see me passing by because mm. they knew that probably I would have snakes with me, right? Because this is their ignorance about the snake. Yeah. A snake will never proactively come to bite. Yeah. A snake is always in defense, always trying to avoid conflict. When you reach into its space where it thinks that it can get physically harmed, for example, if you're lifting a rock, mm. you don't know there's a snake underneath it, but your fingers go under the rock. What the snake sees is that this large set of fingers approaching it's, it, mm. and these fingers might physically harm me. Right. And at the last moment when it can't do anything else, it can't move away from there, it will bite. Right. Similarly, when you step on the snake, when you step on the snake, the snake wants to defend itself from a physical threat, mm. that's when it's going to bite. Uh, what, would, what would your uh, list of precautions be to people who want to say to go for a hike and things like that? What precautions should one take? I always try to tell people, you know, you have to be very observant of your surroundings. Never take it for granted. Mm -hmm. Whether you're hiking or just walking on your path in your, in your compound, make sure that you can see where you're putting your feet and your hands at all okay. times. Even if you're sitting on a rock in the wild, okay. make sure that you know where you're sitting. There could be a scorpion, there could be a centipede, there could be a sun, uh, there could be a snake basking in the sun. Right. Uh, that would get really traumatized seeing this mass of a human being coming on it, whether it's your mm -hmm. foot or whether it's your hand and then it's going to strike. So be very observant. Use your eyes at all times, is mm. my advice. And if it's, if it's in the night and you can't see, uh, you better use a torch. Like right. a lot of people take it for granted. We're stepping out of a house just for a short distance to go and answer nature's call or whatever it is. Mm. And we won't take a torch because we've done it so often and nothing yeah. has happened. But there could be one day that there is a snake there and you could stamp it. Right. So make sure you use a torch. And if you're walking in places like, even if it's a torch, you can't really see. Probably you're walking in mm. high grass or mm. in a dense pile of leaves. Mm. Then ideally you should wear boots or any shoes. Uh, and uh, what about using a stick for vibrations? Does that help? Yeah, that's a very nice question. Uh, we've all learned that if you take a stick or you stamp your feet or you yes. bang the stick, snakes will move away. Uh, what really happens is you need to understand the snake. Hmm. Every snake behaves differently. Okay. For example, if it's a cobra or a crate or a rat snake, a snake there will notice you're coming, which is very good, and okay. will want to avoid conflict, so it will move away. Okay. But now if this is, for example, a viper, a Russell's viper, hmm. you stamp your feet, you make it aware that you're coming, hmm. now the snake is scared, it won't move ah. away. It will coil around and try to hide because that's the behavior of the snake. Right. Some snakes, Correct. when they're scared, they want to flee. Other snakes, when they're scared, they want to just coil and hide and stay and there. And then to attack, maybe. Yeah, yeah and to, defend, to themselves. defend themselves. Yeah, and defend right. themselves. Uh, that's on land. Uh, what happens uh, for, you know, uh, swimmers uh, when you're in the sea and you do see these uh, water snakes? Mm. Um, are they venomous? And what 
So, okay. so when you say water snakes, we have freshwater snakes that generally we consider the checkered keelback. They are okay. harmless. They bite a lot, uh, but they are harmless. They bite okay. a lot. They are okay. non-venomous. Okay. Uh, sea snakes, on the other hand, and if you, when you say a sea snake, they have a flat tail which helps yes, you to swim. Yes, yes. So all sea snakes are venomous, right? Now, mm-hmm. when you're swimming in the sea. And even by mistake, a snake comes onto you on your body for some reason. Yeah, it's also swimming and it wants to take a break and you know rest on your hand. I've seen these pictures of scuba divers and a snake just resting on their shoulders and stuff like that underwater. Mm. The snake won't do anything. However, the only people that get normally bitten by these snakes, if at all, is when they're stuck in a fishing net. Okay, and then people uh-huh. are trying to pull them out, so the snake is already in pain, and that's when it tries to bite. That's for sure. Uh, I have a follow-up question. Uh, very often on the shoreline, you have these sea snakes which are are uh, stranded yes and i have very often taken them and thrown them back a lot of people do that yes. is that a, is that okay to do or? yeah uh, if you see a sea snake on the beach hmm. and you think it's stranded and there's a high possibility it's stranded because many times sea snakes are a bycatch of fishing right okay so they're just dumped on the beach hmm. maybe the snake is tired and you know kind of exhausted and needs help to go back to the sea so hmm. throwing the snake back into the sea or putting it back into the sea is the best thing you can do however okay. Even if the snake is very sluggish and not moving, you should never use your hand. Okay. So use a stick, maybe a meter long stick, hmm. and flip it back into the sea. But don't now, if the snake hand. really wants to go back into the sea or not, I don't know. We'll have to ask the snake. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I get that. Um, in the rare event of, you know, a snake bite, uh, what are the f- first things that we should do? Yeah. Yeah. What do you think you should do? Because uh, the, it's if you ask me, I can tell you a list of things that you should not do rather than what you do. What you do is very simple and very straightforward. Yeah, I would think two things that come to mind. Uh, first of all is not to panic. Uh, and the second thing is to figure out what bit you uh, okay. would be the, the first thing. And uh, of course, then to try and get the anti-venom. But once you, but only if you've identified. Like, how do you know, first of all, whether a venomous snake mm. has bitten you? Mm. You know. But I think the first thing would be not to panic and mm. hope for the best. Uh, <laughs> you think you'd not panic if a snake bites you? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> uh, I I had this incident uh, uh, when I was a teenager where a snake went over my leg when I was watering the garden. And I just remember freezing at that point. You know, so uh, it was no bite, but okay. uh, yeah. So, what you said is really great. I mean, mm-hmm. not to panic and uh, I think you said to, go to identify. identify the snake and go to hospital. Yeah. I would have only a problem with the identification part. Uh, you don't really need to know what snake bit you. Okay. okay. You don't need to know. Because in India, we have something called the big four. I won't go into the details yeah, of that. Uh, but enough. it's called the big four. It's the Russell Viper, Saw Scale Viper, Spectacle Cobra and Crate, mm. uh, which we have anti-snake venom made for all these four snakes. Okay. And it's a common anti-venom. For oh, all the four. Okay. So irrespective of which of these four snakes have bitten you hmm. or any other snake has bitten you, hmm. you go to a hospital, they will test your blood. Hmm. Okay, and they'll continuously test it up every ten minutes or fifteen minutes. Oh. And when they see and when they see venom in your body, they will give you the common anti snake venom. Okay. So you don't really need to identify the snake bite. However, if in ch- by chance you get a chance to take a picture of the snake that has bitten you, it's great. Okay, it will help the doctors prepare for the symptoms because mm. snakes are hemotoxic and some are neurotoxic, you know. So it will help them prepare for the symptoms, but you don't need to. Like many people say that, you know, the doctor has told me that I need to go home and get the snake and so that they can identify the snake. Like, I know people who have gone back home, tried to catch the snake and have been bitten again. So mm. being bitten twice by a snake is not better than being bitten once, right? Right. And secondly, it also has happened that the patient has gone to hospital, the doctor says, I want to see what snake it is, or some nurse says, I want to see what snake it is. Then they send somebody home to search for the snake. And you're losing and time. You're losing time is one thing. And secondly, that the person who catches a snake, it could be a different snake altogether, the snake that has not bitten you. Fair. For example, a crate has bitten you, but in yeah. the same space, there could be a wolf snake. Right. Which looks similar, but it's not a venomous snake. True. Yeah. Or it could be vice versa, right? So. Mm-hmm. Just because it's a wolf snake, you can't assume the patient does not have venom. Maybe there was a wolf snake also in the house, but there was a crate that bit this person. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I don't think you should stress on identification. It's really, really helpful for the doctors, mm. and especially if the doctor knows about snakes. Mm. But it's not the thing that you really need. Yeah? Okay. So I tell people like, if you are walking in the in the jungle or walking in your garden and you're bitten by something, mm. you don't know if it's a snake or scorpion. scorpion. It could be anything. Rush to hospital because mm-hmm. time is very crucial. Go to as soon as possible. To About time. So, uh, from how soon do you need to get to the hospital, or uh, how many hours 
will that can lapse before it becomes critical like what is the t- time that one yeah. needs to keep in mind yeah so that's again an interesting question because uh, for example in goa we have something called the wodi on a cobra it's the bands mm-hmm. on the cobra and mm-hmm. sometimes mm-hmm. they have two bands and sometimes they have two and a half and then people say based on the bands you have either one hour to live or two hours oh. to live or two and a half hours okay. to live which is not true it's 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 a myth right what is really important is various factors uh, some of the main factors are your body mass which mm-hmm. you would probably know right mm-hmm. uh, and another f- important factor is how much of venom the snake has injected into you and it bit mm, you mm. now the thing is you can't ask the snake how much of venom yeah, it has injected right it's not going to tell you uh, and you will never know now it could be a cobra that has bitten you and given you something like called a full bite where it has injected a lot of venom and that's mm. because it's really in pain it's probably hurt injured or it was traumatized too much by you it has injected a lot of venom mm. it could be a cobra that has just defended itself and given you a fake bite it has just mm. hit you and not injected any venom It hmm. just hit you with the lower jaw to scare hmm. you away, which hmm. happens very often with snakes. So you call that a dry bite dry or bite. a fake bite, wherein okay. either they have bitten and not injected venom, or they just hit you with their jaw, but not bitten you. Yeah, so right. we call it a dry bite or fake bite. So it is a venomous snake, but no venom injected into you. Hmm. And then the other factors are like: has it injected the venom into your veins, into your flesh, into hmm. your muscle? Because it all depends on how fast it flows in your body. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's very important. So now talking about first aid again. Yeah. The first thing is you should not panic as you said, but I know people will still panic, right? Mm. Limit the amount of fear. You are not going to die. If you reach hospital on time and they start treating you for it, you're going to be fine. You're going to live to tell a tale. Right. Yeah. Second thing is if there is anything tight on your body or that can get tight when swelling starts, like maybe you're wearing a ring, maybe a bracelet, maybe a watch and you're bitten on your hand, swelling might happen and it will stop the flow of blood or it might be on your foot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you have an anklet or toe rings. Remove anything that's tight or can get tight when swelling starts. Okay. You don't want to stop the flow of blood. Okay. A lot of people used to tie a strip of cloth or a tourniquet. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that's really bad, especially mm-hmm. if it's a hemotoxic snake, if it's a viper bite. Mm-hmm. You know, necrosis sets in. Yeah. And a lot of people have to amputate their hand or leg because they've tied it tight. Right. And never tie it tight. Yeah. Yeah. So remain calm. Do not panic. Remove anything that's tight on your body. Immobilize the hand or the leg or the entire patient, mm. and rush as soon as possible to hospital. Now, for mm. example, you call an ambulance. It's a great thing, but you know the ambulance is stuck in traffic. It's going to take time to come. Might as well hop onto somebody's bike or hop into somebody's car, go towards the ambulance or go towards the hospital. But start going as soon as possible to the hospital. Mm. Symptoms can start happening anywhere from five minutes to thirty-six hours. It can happen any time in between. You don't know. Once you go to hospital, they will test your blood. and they will treat it right oh uh, i have a question can can this anti venom only be administered by medical centers the reason i'm asking is that should uh, guides who do weekend hikes and things like that should they have the anti venom with them at the site because sometimes they could be hiking for 3 hours and then someone gets bitten then transporting that person to a center will take time yeah. so can they administer the anti venom should they have the anti venom what are your thoughts on yeah. that So you can get a very severe allergy reaction when you in, in administer anti venom. You can go into an anaphylactic shock. Okay. Oh. So it's always best to administer anti venom in a hospital setting where you can counter the effects of the allergic reaction or to the other anaphylaxis. Right. Yeah. So don't do it on your own. Never do it on your own. Nobody should do it on their own unless they are a medical professional that has the capacity to deal with the reaction of your body. So the doctors will check your blood and they'll see your symptoms. They'll check your vitals. Mm-hmm. They'll check your blood. Based on that, they will give antivenom. So they start with ten vials, which mm-hmm. is the protocol in India, and then they might stretch it to fifteen, and then twenty, and then up to thirty or thirty-five vials, based okay. on your symptoms, based on the venom in your body, how it's acting in your body, and stuff like that. That brings me to my next question. Uh, people often ask somebody, you know, what is what is the pain like? When you get a tattoo. So my question to you is, what is the? How do you describe the pain when getting bitten by a snake? So yeah. just so that people are prepared for it. That's it a nice reason to get yeah. a tattoo because I've been trying to get one for a long while, but I yeah. can't compare the pain. Yeah. And again, it depends on the pain threshold of the person. But how do you uh, describe it? Is it like a burning sensation? What is it like? The initial pain is like something has pierced you, right? It's, pierced. it's a puncture. Okay. So you're having piercings. Mm. Then eventually you start getting swelling. Depends on the venom, actually. If mm. it's like a Russell Viper bite, there's huge amounts of pain. There's swelling, and it's like as if somebody's stabbing you with a hot iron rod. Oh. Okay. okay. But in the cobra, in the other sense, it's more tingling and it's more of a burning sensation until you know, kind of, it starts having effects like paralysis on you, and then you don't mm. feel anything. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so it depends on the snake. But initial no- pain is a puncture, which is. Do you feel know, nausea? as well yes for neurotoxic snakes normally you feel a lot of nausea yeah okay. so you get that's one of the symptoms of a neurotoxin okay yeah, yeah. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Benil, suppose we, I do encounter a snake. How do I, I figure out whether it's a venomous snake or not? One thing you can do is try to ask the snake that question. <laughs> <laughs> no. So what I tell people is that uh, in India we have around 365 plus snakes. Right. We need to know the snakes that we share space with. Like yeah. if I'm staying in Goa, I need to know the snakes that we have around. Or if I'm going on a trek on the Western Ghats, I need to know a little bit about the snakes found on the Western Ghats. Mm. Now for a scientist or for somebody doing science, they will do scale counting and they'll test the DNA and the genetics to identify a species. Okay. Yeah. But for a lay person, we're not going to catch the snake and count the scales. Mm. Yeah. So what I tell people to do is basically try to identify a snake based on the pattern on the body, not the color, okay. the pattern and the physical characteristics. Okay? okay. So like for example, when I say pattern, a Russell Viper typically has oval shaped marks on the body, like yes. a chain on top. A python, which looks similar to a Russell Viper, has these random patches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a cobra and a rat snake. Now, if you see a cobra, it has the spectacle shape marking. Right. Okay. A rat snake has these black color lines across the mouth and on the tail. Mm. Now, the physical characteristics is that the cobra's head is broad, the neck is broad, the body is broad, and then it tapers at the tail. Right. A rat snake's physical characteristics is a narrow head, mm. widens in the center, and becomes thin at the tail. Mm. So, if you know the pattern on the body. And sometimes it's confusing because nature throws these googlies where the Russell Viper does not have any markings on the back or it has just a single straight line. Then you flip to characteristics of the snake. Okay. Like for example, again, you're confused between a Russell Viper and a python. Mm. Now, Russell Viper, is, if you look at it, it's kind of a matte finish because it has yeah. rough scales and they have large scales. And if you see a python, it's always shining. Right. Whether you put a torchlight on it or if it's sunlight on it, it's always shining. That's because the scales are small and they're closely knit together. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so Ben Hale, I've, uh, I, I've held a snake once or twice, but I want to know what does it feel like when you hold a snake? Yeah. It, uh, we've always been told it's, it's slimy, it's cold. Yeah. What does it actually feel like? Yeah, so here there are two things. Now, are snakes really cold? Now, if I keep them in a cold environment like this, because they can't control their body temperature, they'll start getting very cold. And then mm. to touch, they'll be cold. If you keep them in the sun, they'll start getting warm. To touch, they'll be warm. Mm. Because they're cold blooded and they can't adjust their body temperature. Right. And they can't handle extreme temperatures for the same reason. Right. Okay, so the, f the temperature of the snake depends on where the snake is. Mm. Okay. Now, when it comes to slimy, a lot of people think snakes are slimy. And to be honest, they do look. If, like if you see a rat snake or, or a python, they do look slimy. Or, or is slime and shining, the appearance of it shining kind of, you know, a confusion in our mind? Mm -hmm. Because snakes don't have slime on their body. Right. Okay, they have scales which are tight sometimes and very small and they shine and they look slimy. Okay. Whereas like wipers and all, they are rough scaled. Okay, they have larger scales. And snakes do not secrete any bodily fluids. They don't even sweat. They don't have sweat glands, right? Okay. Because they're cold blooded. So there is not even sweat on the body mm -hmm. for it to be wet. So snake skin is very, very dry. Right. Unless, of course, it's been in the water. Okay. Yeah. Uh, do snakes like to be held? <laughs> as much as I would say that they, they love me and they like to be held by me, but it's not true. No. Okay. Any wild animal wants to be left alone. Right. No matter what animal it is, it needs to have its space. Leave them alone. Just let them be. Admire yeah. them from a distance and that's great. Mm -hmm. The moment you are trying to handle them for whatever reason, the snake is going to get scared. It does not know your intentions. Right. Yeah? As much as you think you can whisper to a snake and communicate with an animal, mm. it's still going to be scared. You're a sure. foreign or a different species. Sure. Like, I don't understand this, you know, that people say that they love snakes and love crocodiles and then you see people catching snakes and kissing them or kissing a crocodile and showing affection like the humans do. Yeah, snakes don't kiss each other. Crocodiles don't kiss each other. <laughs> they don't understand it. But the very fact you're going so close to the animal to kiss it is you're already traumatizing it. Ah, yeah. okay. So Got just it. let them be, I'll give them space. Okay. They're happy without us. <laughs> okay.